Welcome everyone to the Obligations of Memory podcast. I'm Jeffrey Geisner, founder of the Jewish Culture and Holocaust Remembrance Group on Facebook and YouTube. And I'm really pleased and honored to have Judith Tellerman from Chicago with me today. Judith is a clinical psychologist um, and has been teaching at the University of Illinois Medical School, but also uh, she has created beautiful music uh, that uh, really speaks to uh, the songs wanted that she wants to join people through her music to feel the beauty of our wonderful religious heritage that has guided and sheltered us. Her goal is to comprehend ancient wisdom and express it in the music for everyone, regardless of their level of faith. And we're gonna be delighted because Judith is going to bring some of her music to our episodes today, which is just delightful. So welcome, Judith. I'm glad that you're here with us. We wanna hear your family story and, and wanna hear, uh, this all play out. So welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's great to be here. Okay. So I know a little bit about your story and you're going to, and the rest of the audience is going to know a lot more, but I want to start at the beginning where your parents were born um, and how they managed. Now they weren't in the camp, so they, but they do have their own uh, survival story. So why don't we start there as a good place to jump in? Yes. Uh, my parents are from Poland. And they were both from small towns in Poland that ha are destroyed communities now. And they don't exist anymore, not really. Helm is there, my mother was born in Helm. It's there, but it's not really, there's nothing of the people that live there, nothing at all. There's no tombstone, no, it's just that when I try to find my family there, they, they don't exist uh, when I do the research. So, and then Przytyk is known to be a destroyed, uh, Jewish community where my father is from. There was a, a pogrom there, a famous pogrom. And um, I could tell you a little bit about the pogrom if you want to hear it now. Mm -hmm. um, they, there were the Jewish, Jewish people there they had a small community and they had, you know, just regular people. And they heard that the Poles were coming to kill Wait, them. Can I ask you what year we're talking about? Oh, this was uh, 19, it was way before uh, the Nazis. Okay. I, um, I have the date here somewhere. I'll have to look for it for you. Um, the okay, it was March 9th, 1936 was this pogrom. Okay. And so the few Jews got together and they said, look, we know the Poles. If we throw stones at them and we draw blood, they'll run away. We know what will happen. So they had one little boy up in a tree with a gun, one gun. And they went on a, the bridge to stop them from coming into the town. And it's all documented. You can Google it, look up the pogrom of Przytyk, P-R-Z-Y-T-Y-K, and you'll see everything is there. My father told me the story years before any of this went up. You know, we didn't have internet, we didn't have anything. And he told me what happened. And then I read about it and it's right there, exactly how he told me. And um, so they were on the bridge and they did that. They threw the stone, then the poles ran away. So, okay, there was the little boy, the police just stood there and they let them do it. They were, they were with, for, you know, they were for it. And the little boy that was up in the tree, they, they arrested him. So I, later, some American family somehow got that boy out and took him away. But the rest of them, you know, after that, the poles came, they burned everything, all the businesses, everything. And on Facebook, I met someone and she, her, her, uh, my, my grandfather, Mendel Tellerman had the bakery in town and her, her relative had the butcher shop next to the bakery and her relative work, one of her relatives worked in my grandfather's and we found each other in a Holocaust group on Facebook. Isn't that amazing? And, sure. it, you know, what can I say? Like, so anyway, um, after that, of course, the Jews they had nothing. So they ended up gravitating. They went to Lodz. Well, in Helm, meanwhile, back in Helm, it was terrible, horrible what was going on with the Jews in Helm. Um, my, my mother's father was assassinated by a Polish general. He was on a horse and he pierced my grandfather with his sword. My grandfather was a chassid uh, and he was a well, very well-known person in the town of Helm. And so after that, my, my parents, my mother went from, from, she was affluent and then they became very poor. 
because they didn't have a father anymore. Her brothers were older and then she was born, she was in the womb when her father was assassinated. So she came already into this world with traumatic trauma and, and traumatic stress. Uh -huh. So she, you know, they, everyone did the best they could. And eventually every, they went to Ludge too. And eventually um, what, when they were in Ludge, my mother's mother died and her cousin, Arthur Ziegelbein, who's very famous in Poland, they have movies about him and television shows. He's a great martyr of Poland. He was in the Polish government. He was very close he was my my uh, mother's first cousin, and he very close to her. He took her. He said, "You have a beautiful voice." He brought her to the Hazomir of Ludge, which was the preeminent Jewish choir. They accompanied all the symphonies. They did Beethoven's Ninth. They did La Traviata, and they sang operas in Yiddish. But they they were with the famous um, orchestras of Poland singing. So she was their little. Pizzola, their little baby, little child. She was the youngest one there and she sang with them. She's the only survivor at the end. She was the last survivor of the Hazemir of Ludge. And um, they actually did a, a movie about it. The Zamir of Boston made a PBS movie about Hazemir of Ludge. They went back for the hundredth anniversary and they, you know, my mother described it. That building wasn't bombed and it was exactly the way they rehearsed and went up the steps. My mother described the whole thing. It was there. So that was, my father heard my, met my mother. She was singing. She was 15. He was 17. They fell in love. Then they told the men to go. They were going to march and they were going to fight. This was in, in oh, they, in, they were ready. They went to Warsaw. People kept moving, moving to get away from the trouble. So now they're in Warsaw. They take my father. He goes on this march and he sees they leave him out in a field with the rain pouring down, cold rain for three days. He said, they're going to kill us all. My father had read Mein Kampf and he was aware of what was coming. So he said to the men, we have to run away. They're, and they were shooting at them and they ran through the woods. A lot of them got shot. My father kept going till he reached my mother. Are we after 1939 or? No, it's a, no, they haven't invaded Warsaw yet. Okay. So he went, he got my mother and he said, we have to leave. They're, you know, they're going to kill all of us. I see what's happening. So they went to my father's parents and they said, we're too old. There's no place to go except to try to sneak over the border to Russia. And they shoot at you and we can't go. We're old. So we give you our blessings. And my father always remembered that he never got over that he had to leave his parents there. And they went to my, my sister's brothers who were rabbis who married them. And then they ran and fled across the border into Russia. And then that saga begins of everything they went through, which was unbelievable what happened there with my father ending up in the Russian army in the siege of Leningrad. And out of 11,000 men of his battalion 50 survived one of my one of them was my father and you know when I was a li little girl very little my father used to tuck me in at night and tell me stories from the bible and I looked at his hand I saw this big scar and I said daddy what's that he said oh that's a bullet wound from the war and then he told me later they you know they patched him up and they sent him back to the front with that bullet wound and I said to him daddy you're a hero you're my hero he said no I'm just like everybody else that went through what we went through. We where, all. Where was your mother at that time when he was in uh, in the army? My mother was in Russia, and going around trying to figure out what to do. They had been breaking stone. They had to earn money. They had, you know, they were they were just fugitives, you know. So they were breaking rocks, working on farms, anything they could do. She ended up somehow in Tajikistan, she had, she had my sister, uh, my sister lived until she was 13 months and then died there from the conditions. In, in where she went, their houses were made of dried cow dung and they would take the patty and build, make a hut. And that's where she was trying to survive without my father. And she didn't know 
anything like what happened. So at the end, when it was all over, my father, he was looking for my mother. He didn't know, had no idea where she was. She went back and she was in the Feldefink DP camp in Germany. And he, he started going, he went to Italy because he heard that Jews, they brought the Jews out of the camps and they were supposedly going to ship them to Israel, but of course the British wouldn't let them. So they went, were going to Cyprus. So he went there to look, to see, is my mother there? He couldn't find her. So he went to the Vatican and he asked the Pope to send a letter to the Feldefink camps because he knew there were Jews in Germany in the DP camps. And it said, Herzliche Griesen, Moshe Tellerman lebt, means Mars Tellerman is alive. They got the letter, they got the postcard in the camp and they read it. My mother heard it. How can you even believe it? He was in Italy in the Vatican. And when he was there, I have to say my father, he had such Yiddishkeit in him. When he went to Russia with my mother and their brothers said, you're going to a country with no God because they're communists, you know? And she said, I have God, God is with me. And when my father went, he said that they were brother and sister just like Abraham and Sarah, because he was going into the wilderness, into the, you know, the land of no Jews or whatever. But he, he did find Jews when he was there. He always looked for the Jews in Russia and found them. Please share, so, with, us, please share with us about the train and the Blitzkrieg. Oh, yeah. My father had this sense when, when destruction was coming, and that's how he kept surviving all these terrible things. And so they were on a train in Russia in the middle of nowhere. They would jump on these trains, you know, they were trying to, they were just kids and they running, you know. So they were on this train, freezing cold, snow everywhere. And my father says, we have to get off the train. The Messerschmitts are coming, which are the German planes. My mother goes, I don't hear, I don't, there's nothing. What are you talking about? Get off, we're getting off right now. And they got off and then the train, the planes came and bombed the train and destroyed the train. And that was how my father was. He just had some ability to sense this danger. And and um, anyway, he, he was so like, he wasn't somebody that would be quoting from the Bible or this or that, you know, he was very like, it was just in him. Yiddishkeit was in him, in every fiber, in, in his blood, in his bones. You don't have to be somebody that, can quote, you know, scripture and knows every, whatever, you know, it, you don't have to have necessarily be that kind of a person to be a real Jew. He was a real, real Jew. So let me, so if I want to track this and for our audience, your, we, I kind of get where your father was, but hey, how did your mother get to the DP camp in Germany and from <laughs> where? I don't even know. See, they did their they did their testimonies. They were taped mm -hmm. at the Holocaust Documentation Education Center in South Florida. They did a thousand uh, tapes and then they donated them to the Holocaust Museum in Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. So I they have they have the, the tapes, but they they got kind of ruined and now they got funding to make them digital. So I haven't looked at these tapes in years and it's very hard to look very very hard for me to look at those tapes and yeah. to see the suffering that they went through and how my mother you know what she had to do bury this child by herself you know in the middle of nowhere like just horrible just horrible well, things. i want to move the discussion um, not to be painful okay. and yeah. uh, I want to understand how your parents came to the United States or were that they maybe they went to Israel or another country to get. So tell me about the path. They obviously were married. They sometimes they were treated. They treated themselves as brother and sister. But how did they after the war get to the United States? Well, my father ended up going to Feldefink to the DP camp and found my mother. And then they were there together. And from the DP camp, they came to Brooklyn. Okay, so they got a visa. Did someone sponsor I, them into? No one, no one sponsored them. An organization brought them over. I guess? I, it, no, it was not a Jewish organization. I don't know exactly 
my mother said they weren't Jewish. They it was some organization that was helping them and brought them over. And how old were they? When did, do you know how old they were when they came to the United States in Brooklyn? Well, it was in 47. And my mother was born in 22. Okay. My father was born. In, my father was born in 21 in, okay. in, in uh, Nazi Berlin. Uh, and he escaped at age 15 out uh, in through uh, the last uh, Adasik Aliot kinder transport. And he got them, 100 teenagers went to Palestine. So, um, but my parents, I think unlike your parents, never ever spoke to my sister and myself about their war experiences. It sounds like, and I'm gonna ask you, how actively engaged were your parents in telling you about the Holocaust and when did that start? Well, they said very little. My father said, we don't wanna make you crazy. We don't wanna talk about it because what it's gonna to do to you. So here and there things would come out, but mm -hmm. they didn't like talk about it. But and you know- you have, Also, how many siblings do you have and how old, have what's the difference? Two. My, I have one sister, Debbie, who's 15 months younger. And then my sister, Barbara's 10 years younger than me. And my parents, they were, the thing is, even though they didn't talk about it all the time, my mother was a volunteer for 15 years at the Holocaust Documentation Education Center. And she was transcribing tapes of testimony, of survivor's testimony to make sure all the spelling was correct. And she was going to student awareness and giving speeches. And she, you know, she was leading a, a Yiddish culture uh, group. So that, that leads and, to this question. So it sounds just from what you've just said about your mother, she's highly educated. She speaks multiple languages. And now tell me a little bit about what they came to Brooklyn and what did they do? How did they make their way in Brooklyn? They obviously came with not a, not a penny to their name, probably didn't speak any of the language. And when they came, so tell no, me actually, they weren't highly educated. They only had the basic school. They were kids, and then they ran. Mm -hmm. So they really were not educated. Mm -hmm. But they knew different languages. They were good at, you know, they learned the languages and they could communicate. But no, they didn't have formal education. Obviously, your father allowed because I've interviewed many who wanted their wives to stay home and take care of the children be very nurturing in that way to make sure that the dinner table is always set. But your father seems to enable your mother without problem for her to go and do the education, which I think is fabulous. Well, actually, my mother didn't. She was, she couldn't go get an education. No, no, I'm talking about the fact that your father went and enabled your mother to have the career of going to the, being a volunteer at the oh, that Oh yeah, sure. Oh sure. He took her, he brought her. Right, but not very, what yeah. Some of the other interviews that I've done, the, the, the parent wouldn't want the wife to go out of the, it was much more of a controlled environment. He didn't want to let her to go outside and see the world. If you can understand kind of the struggles that some Holocaust yes. parents had. Yes. But it seems- no, Yeah, you? not my dad. Yeah. So what he did was you, how, very, how, did you, how did your dad make a living? Well, when we came, he, he got some training as a tailor. And when we came to Brooklyn, he worked in high fashion mm -hmm. on 7th Avenue. Mm -hmm. And he was a tailor there. And it was hard. It was, it was rough to, in the sweatshops, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so while they were there, and my mother was... Um, she had very bad migraines and she would fall down and faint. And she was, it was hard, very hard for her. And the doctor said to my father, take your mother to the country. So we had an egg man and he was also some type of Jewish survivor or whatever. He said to my father, oh, you should buy a farm in New Jersey and then you'll be in the country. Oh where, my God. Where in, where in New Jersey? Flemington. Oh, I know Flemington really well. We used yeah. to live in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and you know where, and that's only an hour from Flemington. In fact, I had a store in Flemington, New Jersey. You're kidding. Oh, and my, wife, have... my wife and I uh, um, ran that store. It was a fragrance and cosmetic outlet store in Flemington in the late oh in the 80s. Yeah. Oh, see, we were long gone by then. But you must know the Resnicks, Carl Resnick. They uh, had the big department store there. I, I know the okay. name, but I, I'm not sure. 
my wife knows everybody, but I'm I'm <laughs> I'm more introverted. That's so funny. Oh yeah. my goodness. So your father is working on Seventh Avenue on high fashion. And how does he make more of himself? Does he move up into well, we went, we went to, he bought the farm. Okay. So they saved up the money. My mother said, we just used all the money that we were saving for your college education to buy the farm. It was, you know, so in the middle of the this night. Was working, all, this was a working farm? Oh, yeah. Chicken, poultry, eggs. Which eggs. is because I know a lot of um, survivors went to Vineland, New Jersey. Yes. That was the had, other. And they had chicken farms and were growing and made their careers on the farm in Vineland. And my my uh, college roommate was from Vineland, and I didn't know anything about it until I started this whole this whole Michigas that I'm doing now. So, the yes, uh, Vineland was the other the other place like that. And then we were the, there were a few survivor families in that area, and so we had this farm, and it was um, thousands of chickens. That's basically it. <laughs> That's your memory of growing up. You have a memory of growing up with a thousand chickens in your parents. Now, what did you, um, now what would your sister say? Would she say the same thing? She, yeah. Yeah. I mean, my sister, 15 months younger. We went out to the farm. And of course, it was very hard for us in the beginning. We got sick a lot. We were in the hospital a lot. It was just, you know, really a tough uh, adjustment from Brooklyn. So here's and, without being a clinical psychologist. And, and putting that part of your brain to work. Do you recognize, did your parents have uh, traumatic ex episodes that they expressed in front of you or was it happening at night in the middle of the night? Do they have nightmares, screams? Yeah, screaming. Screaming, so you experienced that growing up? Yeah. Okay, so now we're gonna take this, uh, we're gonna take this a little bit further, but I would like to invite you to play we're getting close to the first 30 minutes of our episodes together. So I'd like you to play and give us a little introduction uh, to this of why about your mother and her ability and her beautiful singing and how this obviously was inherited, came through the DNA to you. Uh, <laughs> and I would love for you to introduce not only the music that you're belovedly doing on behalf of your mom, but also what does it do for you and uh, I think it plays a special part in your life. So please, let's talk about that for a second. And then we want to respond. Yes, and I, I want to say about this particular song that I'm going to do. This is a song that my mother sang to me. So this song, I don't think it exists anywhere else that I know of. It's, she was in this school, in a Catholic school. That's what they had in Poland. And the nuns, they loved her because she was so smart and she did, did the speeches and the poems. She could recite pages of poems and everything. They called her Jew and they loved her, but they, that, they call her Jew with that self-assuredness of their superiority, that they were superior and that she was from a demeaned people, you know? And so part of what she did in the school was to give a speech about the most famous Polish general, General Josef Haller, who made the marriage of Poland with the Baltic Sea, opened up the port, which opened up trade and did wonderful things for Poland. He was the biggest hero of Poland. And then he went into the government. Later, she found out to her complete, I mean, I don't know how she could even handle it, how it broke her heart, that this general, Joseph Haller, came to Helm and pierced her father with a sword and killed him when she was in the womb. She was, and so, and he was killing Jews in Helm. It's documented that Joseph, Joseph Haller did that on his horse, you know, and so, so now she's in her mother's womb, already surrounded by the terrors of the anti-Semitism of the Poles toward the Jews, okay? That happened in September 16th of 1922, way before the Nazis. This was going, just like the Bruschitic pogrom, all of these things were going on in Poland, threatening. They say there was a 
thousand years of the flourishing of the Jews in Poland. The reason we flourished was from our own selves, how we can survive through anything and still flourish because they were killing us. They were doing everything to prevent us from flourishing. The, the Jews were segregated to the pale. They weren't allowed to have agriculture. They weren't allowed to be in the trades. They were, they were just, you know, the worst things that you, they were poor in the shtetls. They were so poor. And, and this is the flourishing. Well, of course, we had newspapers, books, plays, everything, book, everything that we were doing. We did it within ourselves, by ourselves, with no real support from the outside world at all, in spite of them trying to kill us and do terrible things to us. So I just wanted to say that because you'll read a lot about the thousand years of the flourishing of the Jewish culture in Poland and they never did anything. You know, come on, we, yeah, we flourished. We flourished no matter where we are, we flourish by ourselves in our own way. We don't let anything stop us from studying and learning and creating and inventing and everything. So now when, when the Jews of Helm knew that they were abandoned, there was a Balfour Declaration creating the state of Israel that was signed. It was done. It was a done deal. And then England reneged betrayed the Jewish people. And they knew, but they couldn't do anything about it. They weren't fools, they knew. So my mother sang me a song, the Balfour Declaration song that the Jews sang in Helm about what happened. And that's the song that we're going to have now that came from my mother. Beautiful. And it's, it's a, uh, it, and I, what I did was when I heard it, I said, this is archival. This is very important because it documents something that really happened in history. And what I did was I also adapted it in English and I put English with it and we made a musical arrangement and then produced it and recorded it. Please. I did that with my producer. So this is it. This is the Balfour Declaration song. Okay. Now. Do you want me to Wait. hold on a minute? I have to, I can't access it. Where is it? I'm not seeing the, um... okay, now. Restored at last 
you know that we're coming up to the end of our first 30 minutes which just went by like a snap and i am jeffrey geisner for the obligations of memory podcast for the jewish culture and holocaust remembrance i'm speaking to Judith tellerman and we'll be back in a minute for part two of our program thanks for being with us and we'll see you soon <laughs>